Healthcare.gov has taught us that billions of dollars is being spent on technology that just doesn't work. It's not just healthcare, it's food stamps, it's the DMV, it's our schools. Code for America, sometimes called the Peace Corps for Geeks, is trying to address this by matching software geniuses with U.S. cities to reboot local services. We're excited to welcome Jennifer Palka to the studio today. She's the founder of Code for America, and she also recently spent a year at the White House as the U.S. Deputy Chief of Technology. We're so excited to have you. Thank you for being a great friend and collaborator to Google. I think it'd be fun to start by having you tell us in your own words what Code for America is. Code for America, as you said, is the Peace Corps for geeks. It was really started because we were in the middle of this, you know, what we called the Web 2.0 revolution, and yet the technology and government is stuck back in the 1980s. And that's a problem for taxpayers. As you said, we're spending so much more on technology than we should, really orders of magnitude more. But it's also a problem because when services don't work, like health track of, or like when you go to the DMV, or when you ch try to enroll your chi child in school, um, you really have this experience of not trusting government. And we must trust our government to have a functioning society. I'm sure you're combating a lot of perception with your program that government can't change. Mm -hmm. So I think hearing a few of your success stories or some of the innovative technology that has been built would be really great. We see all the time that while there's great software technologists and developers and designers that want to come help, there are also great people inside government who want their help and want to try things a new way. They know that it's not working. So I'll give you an example. Um, when we worked in the city and county of San Francisco last year with a team of folks who were looking at the problem of food stamps. Um, now there's a lot of different problems that happen with food stamps, but they were particularly looking at the fact that when you enroll in this program, most often you fall right off of the rolls. So you spend a lot of time applying and then suddenly you're not on it and your um, EBT card, your food stamps card doesn't work. It turns out that it's really about a lot of very confusing notices that you get in the mail that aren't written in human language. They're, very long and very confusing and we enrolled in the program and couldn't figure them out either and so you haven't complied with something that they're asking for you some piece of, of information and they drop you off the rolls. We ended up doing a very simple intervention which is to text message people when they're about to fall off the rolls and telling them to call the office and that meant that 40 percent more people stayed in the program which is great so that's a lot of money that we're saving and a better experience for the citizens but more importantly, what we found out is that the people that we worked with in government then understood the importance of enrolling in their own programs. Mm -hmm. When they moved on to new programs, they said, the first thing I'm going to do is sign up for it so I understand the experience that my users are having. That's fantastic. That means we have this whole new generation of people who work in government who care about the user experience and they know the technology is going to have to change dramatically in order to have that better experience. So you talked about text messaging as an mm -hmm. important channel, mm -hmm. text messaging. And I think a lot of people in Silicon Valley would jump to building an app. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the importance of that channel for the audience the fellows are trying to serve? Right now, we're seeing that a lot of the people who need government services don't have internet at home. So if they're going to be accessing these services, it'll be possibly on a smartphone, um, but generally a low-end one. And so it really has to work in that format, but very often they'll only have a feature phone. So a lot of what we do must use just text messaging. One of the first programs we did in the city of Philadelphia, for instance, was about getting better feedback on the city plan. They were in the middle of a very long-term plan for Philadelphia, and they knew they needed feedback from the citizens about things like where there were food deserts or which rail lines needed to be extended. But the people who show up for the input sessions at City Hall tend to be not the people who are affected by the changes that are going to be made in the plan. So they knew that they had these specific questions and they went out and put posters up. So there was a poster in a certain area saying, where do you shop for your food if it was a food desert? Or in a bus shelter asking, should this bus line be extended? Would you, uh, would you ride this, this line if it were extended? And the way to respond is to, is to write back in text. Well, you're getting exactly the people you know you're trying to ask of, and they're very easily able to respond. And that just changed completely how they got feedback for the plan in ways that are so much more useful and so much cheaper. A lot of people are frustrated with their schools. Can you talk about any fellow projects that have worked in that space? In our very first year, we worked with the Boston Public Schools, and we worked on a really small problem, but it's one that is right at the beginning of your experience with schools, which is selecting a school for your kid. 
they had just changed the rules in Boston about where kids could go, and they had this 28-page brochure with tiny, tiny type that you were supposed to read and then figure out where your kid could go. Truly, it was a mapping problem, uh, and it was about the distance between the school and your home. And so we did a very simple web app that lets you type in your address and the age of your kid, and it would tell you which schools you were eligible to attend. And it really just changed the relationship between the parents and the schools, where they really felt like they were starting off on the right foot. Now so much more has happened, and we're doing working with Rhode Island this year to make sure that when you start filling out all of those forms when your kid enrolls in school, that you only have to write your name and your address once instead of 40 different times. Now, it's little things like that they think are adding up to people feeling better about this, the experience they're having with public schools. So your fellows come from some of the most agile, fast-moving mm -hmm. technology companies. What's mm -hmm. been really shocking to them as they've tried to work with government or big lessons? Well, our fellows come from a lot of places. A lot of them come from Google, yeah. which is great. Mm -hmm. um, and we're very glad to have them and would love to have more. But yes, they do tend to be in places that, that build stuff quickly and have a, a philosophy of you know, build it and iterate it and also measure it as you're building it, which is something that doesn't happen often in government. They are often shocked at the level of risk aversion in government. We've done things like trying to get data out about the locations of fire hydrants in a city and we'll be told sometimes, oh, we can't let that data out because it would be in the hands of the terrorists. Hmm. Um, or right now we're trying to solve the problem of people using EBT, the electronic benefit transfer cards, which is what you get for food stamps. If they use those cards in places that charge a fee, a lot of their benefits you know, go to a bank instead of to food. And we were asking for the locations of free ATMs and we're told, oh, you know, that's, that's not data that we can make public. Well, there's really no risk to it. And if you come from the world where it's always best to have it open, it's a very difficult response to hear. Mm -hmm. We really try to get our fellows to understand that it's a different culture and that they have to work with them and that the public servants who throw up barriers to opening things are doing it because they genuinely believe that they're protecting the public. And you must tap into that notion of service, um, even if it's misguided, mm -hmm. and understand that they have the same intentions that we do, which is to serve the public as well as they can. I've heard so many great case studies in specific cities your fellows mm -hmm. have worked in, and I'd love to know more about how do you make them sustainable and mm -hmm. how do you scale them? How can you take a success like Honolulu yeah. Answers mm -hmm. and bring it to a lot of cities? The program that you mentioned was uh, in, in Honolulu where they tried to fix the website. It was a very large, clunky website with a lot of information that wasn't useful to users at all. And they um, actually used volunteers in the community in a very simple, basic interface to rewrite the answers that most citizens were coming to the website to get answered. And this was a huge success. They pulled the whole community together to sort of rewrite this website in simple, clear language. And then that's spread now um, really just through the community to all sorts of cities that want to do this. Um, and the city may or may not participate. In Oakland, where I live, the city is very much involved with it. In fact, they host Oakland Answers. And the community is there to not only write the site, but keep it updated and maintained. Our Oakland, our Oakland Brigade, our volunteers that live and work in Oakland and part of the Code for America Brigade, maintain the technology, but the citizens really maintain uh, the content in it. We have this notion of for the people, by the people. It really must be the people who come to the table to make this work. And that works in some cases. A really great way that Code for America technology has been sustained is through companies. Mm. We've had seven companies spin off of Code for America. Text is in, the one I mentioned um, that allowed you to text message the city about the city plan, um, is now a, a very vibrant company working with hundreds of cities around the country. Um, another one is Open Counter that simplifies the business permitting process, mm -hmm. makes it so much easier than it is without that. Um, and we're just now working with a new company uh, called Transit Mix that actually lets you mix and match transit lines in your city and is being used by city employees. When we build businesses around these technologies and allow people not just to use them on a volunteer basis, but to buy them as a vendor, we can see really great growth in sustainability. But we've also seen great success um, where we've helped governments bring in the skills and the talent they need to maintain the technology that Code for America builds for them. And that, in some ways, is my favorite path to sustainability because it means that you've got people in there now. They're going to help that city make far better choices in the future about a whole wide range of things. And that's true sustainable change. I think by now a lot of our audience is wondering how they can help or get involved. Mm -hmm. You mentioned brigades. I mm -hmm. think it would probably be helpful to tell a little bit more about those. 
So we have brigades in about seven cities around the country, and all that means is that there are people in that city who have some degree of technical skills, from incredibly talented technologists to people who are just comfortable using technology, mm -hmm. but know that that's the best way for them to help make their communities better. So they get together generally Tuesday or Wednesday nights, generally in City Hall because they're working with local government, and they work on open data portals or they work on standing up applications uh, that help people in their community. And it is a really great way to get involved and to understand a little bit better the problem that we're trying to solve. We always say, we the people will solve this problem. We also, as the people, need to understand how government works, and often we don't want to do that. This is a great way to not only understand the problem, but to get to meet the people in government who are really trying to help. Um, so I would encourage anybody um, to join their local brigade, and there are several in the Bay Area, but also if you live somewhere where there isn't a brigade, to start one and lead one. Um, that takes time, but it's a lot of fun, and you'll end up with a community of people that you really enjoy and feeling really good about the work that you guys can do together. There are, of course, a lot of other ways to get involved. Mm -hmm. From the highest commitment, which is to go work in government, we always encourage people to think about taking a couple of years out of your career, whether you're spending it at Google or sort of bouncing around, to take some time and apply to work in government. There are some fantastic positions open where you really can do good. We always hear from folks that they know that this will make a difference. They just need to know that they have a real chance. And there are now so many more places where you can go into government and have a real shot at making a difference than there were several years ago. And of course, the Code for America Fellowship is a great way <laughs> to work with government but through us, which is you know easier, there's a lot of fewer constraints, yeah. you're doing it for a limited amount of time and you have a lot more freedom than when you're working in government. It's an annual program and we'll be recruiting for it again in a couple of months. Great. So let's look at the civic open data space. Mm -hmm. I think there's been a ton of energy around it, but mm -hmm. it hasn't realized its potential yet. And I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that and what could make big, big movement in that space. That movement's been so exciting for the past couple of years, and it's been a lot of what has drawn the attention of the tech community to government of, at, in the first place. So I think it's had success in certain ways. Mm -hmm. And I think early on, hackathons were able to sort of show what's possible in a way that sort of opened the door to government getting on board. For, people in government saying, okay, if we open this data, the community can build us an app that is so much cheaper and so much better than we would have gotten if we'd done it through a procurement process. So, so many great early wins, but because it is hard to open data and because it's hard for government to understand how to get that data open um, with the characteristics that will make it useful, and you yourself, Steph, has said it needs to be licensed, uh, it needs to be updated, and it needs to be structured. Um, well, it's one thing to open it, and it's another thing to make sure that it meets all those criteria so that it continues to be useful for developers and then, of course, through the developers to the, for the citizens. Um, there's more that government needs to do, but there's also more that the developer community needs to do to demand these things and to help government to do these things. I think of one of the companies that we've worked with through our accelerator program called Captricity. Mm -hmm. They can take data that's currently locked in paper forms and get it into structured data very, very quickly through a wonderful combination of OCR and, and Amazon Mechanical Turk, and they're getting huge amounts of government data into a structured format so that people mm -hmm. can use it. They had a great success in my time in D.C. clearing the backlog of adverse effects of drugs at the FDA. Mm -hmm. It took them six months to contract to do this work, and the, they had structured data in their hands in six hours. Wow. So the tools really are there for us to be able to have this data available. And of course, when you release that data, think of what the community can do to help flag when there's been a bad batch of some sort of drug or some pill, um, and the FDA can, can actually act on that. That's exactly the kind of thing that we need the community to come to the table and say, yes, we can make this data unbelievably useful to save lives. So you spent a year in the White House. What was your biggest learning there? I think my biggest learning in the White House was that we are at at a very unique moment in time. I happened to be there during the failure of healthcare.gov. My boss was Todd Park, who went off to rescue the site and did so really heroically, along with the help of many others, many Googlers, who worked incredibly hard to do it. But what I saw during that rescue were policymakers understanding that they need 
the technical world. They need geeks to make this work. When I was there, I was asked to go start working on the problems of immigration because the people in the Domestic Policy Council realized that if the Affordable Care Act, having worked so hard to get it passed, was vulnerable because we can't build a website that works, what happens when we finally get immigration reform passed? Will the systems not scale and we'll be at risk of losing that policy as well? That's something no, no, nobody wants to have happen. But the good news is now they realize that it, we can't rely on the ways that we've been trying to do technology. Sure, you can have a vendor that's going to tell you, no problem, the site will work. Well, they've been there, and they don't trust that anymore. But they trust people like Mikey Dickerson, who came from Google to help save the site. They trust the people who build technology that does work for us in our daily lives, and they want them there. And I think for the first time, they want them there, and they're willing to give them the power to do it right. And that's the first time in history we've been in that place. So I just want us to take advantage of that moment. Since they want us there, let's show up. <laughs> let's be there, and let's make this work. Because they've never before realized how important geeks are. <laughs> so digital and technology people in government is critical. Do you think we're going to see more of that in elected officials? I think the people will demand it. I think people, the general public is realizing that if we can't implement the policies we create, we can't govern. And if we continue to have a political class that's so disconnected from how the world works today, we just manage through software. That is the reality. It's not some other thing. And if our political class doesn't understand that, they're not going to do a good job helping run the country. I think we will increasingly see people in bureaucracy and in elected positions with not necessarily technical skills, but with a fundamental understanding of how the digital world works. That's what we need. It's a difference between knowing what's easy and knowing what's hard, mm -hmm. and a difference between thinking of technology as something you buy and something that you work on in service of a user. Great. So if our viewers want to learn more about Code for America, where mm -hmm. can they go? They can go to codeforamerica.org. They can go look at our TED Talk online. Um, and they can ask other people that they know at Google who've been involved with the program. Great. Well, we're so grateful you came today. Thanks, Jen, for your time with us. Thank you so much. It's great to be here.